last but not least for this uh, round of presentations, we have Ramsey, also a repeat guest at Vision Weekend now. Thank you so, so much uh, for sponsoring and for enabling so many people to join on subsidized attendance tickets. Take it away. This talk is about the future. A little bit about myself. My name is Ramsey Brown. I'm the CEO at Mission Control AI. We build secured cognitive augmentation infrastructure for defense and commercial purposes. Everybody in this room is used to playing with large language models or you're an expert in enough of a technical field that you're comfortable talking about large language models. If you're a 54-year-old marketing manager in Chicago who works at MasterCard and in Q1, your IT supervisor tells you now you have access to ChatGPT, that's something you have no idea what to do with. We help solve these problems for enterprise and defense by providing the missing training, use case clarity, and real-time governance infrastructure to help them make sense of that world. Um, but I'm not here to talk about that. It's Vision Weekend, so this is my one chance a year to get weird with it. <laughs> I think that the future is a thing we, that we reciprocally invent as it invents us back. And this talk was originally entitled The Overton Prism from 2024 to 2029, or My Son Married a Robot. Uh, because I think we have to have car hard conversations about this reciprocally causal process of us inventing reality as it unfolds through this hyperstitional process in the constructed social reality and the technical reality as much as it shapes us back. And I think that a lot of rubber is about to hit the road in the next few years in ways that become a lot more normal for people who would look at a thing like Vision Weekend and say, wow, what a bunch of weirdos, and they're correct. Um, but also because that's where a, a lot of, of the good is going to get done in the world around these frontier technologies. And I think there's a responsibility on our shoulders as the kind of people who are here doing a thing like this to be thoughtful about the gaps that emerge and what can be done to close the gaps that emerge between envisioning better worlds as they could exist and working with the incentive structures of the baseline realities that we operate in. Um, and I go back to this quote from Charlie Munger nearly all the time because I find it to be extremely grounding. One of my best friends in my PhD program at the University of Southern California is a great behavioral economist, Dr. Dalton Combs, and he really inculcated into me the idea that people, and especially from a behavioral economics perspective, largely do what they're incentivized to do. This is really helpful, and uh, bless the passing of, of Charlie Munger for this, but Munger Woods did famously say, show me the incentive and I will show you the outcome. And I want to keep this in mind, especially in AI right now, because especially in AI safety, there's a lot of chained magical thinking going on about a world that could exist that would potentially be safer that is disconnected from the grounded incentive structures that we currently find ourselves in. Our responsibility as adults in the room is to navigate that and to close the gaps between the world as it could be envisioned and through the lens of existential hope and the baseline realities that we have to operate in. I think this is a non-trivial problem and I think it's worth everyone's attention. So this talk was about the Overton window as a, a really abused metaphor here of something that we'd call the Overton prism. And we call it the Overton prism for two reasons. Um, the first is that it actually bends concepts around itself and it does split concepts. Um, for those not familiar with the Overton window, the Overton window describes the, the conceptual space, so to speak, by which we can have politically acceptable conversations. And the Overton window became the subject of focus in the Donald Trump elections because it got blown wide open where suddenly people could say things out loud they'd previously considered political anathema or political suicide. Um, and it became a little more in mainstream consciousness because it's what conversations are we allowed to have? And what I'm going to propose to you through this talk, which is largely focused on cyborgization in the next few slides, is that the Overton window actually is an active process, that it's not just that ideas pass through it, but as ideas pass through it, they do both bend and they do split. For example, when it comes to things like AI capabilities, um, where there's just a window, we could have meaningful conversation as adults about Stanford's reports that we're expecting seven out of 10 knowledge workers to be structurally unemployed due to automation in the next few years, but instead we get asked questions like, what's your PDOOM? Um, this also goes the other way around, and I don't want to pick on the existential risk crowd or the labor crowd reciprocally, because the problem here is that when it comes to the implicit biases we have and the cultural biases we have around talking about edge problems, our ideas tend to get a little bent out of shape as we go through. And if we can keep this in mind while trying to envision better futures than we have today, I think that's actually a really meaningful mechanism for trying to, to actively make better decisions faster about the shape of things to come. So in this first sense, when we pass ideas through the Overton prism, they distort. In the second sense, they also split. 
Because when we pass the idea of AI capabilities through the Overton prism and it goes mainstream, we find that these impact things other than linear algebra. If you make linear algebra very fast and very cheap and show it all of Reddit, it turns out this actually has downstream impacts on things like education, sexuality, our notions of our connections to God, whether or not we can still maintain political consensus in the world, what we do for fun, and even whether or not people are willing to have kids in that world anymore. I know we're in San Francisco. I know this is an active conversation amongst 30-somethings right now, but whether or not they're going to engage in the biological imperative because of the, some of the downstream things going on in linear algebra. What the hell? Yet here we are. That's where you live. That's what's happening. And it's okay to talk about because it, it begs of us to be adults in the room about that process. Because this is a mutually causal process. We are inventing the future as it invents us back. And hyperstition is a two-way street here. This isn't like a thing that happens to us. It's a thing we're actively constructing that is shaping us as we go. So the question becomes then, where are we in that timeline and where are we going? Allison, to your credit, we love the idea of tech trees. And we think about what the tech trees are shaped like as we leave the Anthropocene and enter the Synthocene. If anyone doesn't know, this is the work of Zach Wienersmith at Saturday Morning Breakfast Cereal. To be clear, you're somewhere like here-ish. I think this is just Reddit. Like, I think that's actually what Reddit is. Just plug it in the back of your head. Um, so the interesting questions for us become, again, if we go back to Charlie Munger, under what incentive structures are we currently operating in this relationship between humanity, technology, and capital, and why would we get certain outcomes and not others? Humanity, technology, and capital to a first approximation want largely orthogonal things. And it's up to us to figure out who gets what they want here. When we look at the tech tree around cyborgization, we actually see a forking of the tech tree. We see this as being a distributed process in which man becomes more machine-like and machine becomes more like man. I want to talk about each of these specifically because as we think about what it means for man to become more machine, um, raise your hand if you've heard the term digital transformation. That's a shocking amount of people. Usually it's just like McKinsey and Accenture wonks. Um, that's a shocking amount of people in a room who's heard this. But uh, to the, the median person, the idea that there is a systematic process of datafication and standard operational principleification of reality itself is a bit of a shocking thing. But I guess to this crowd, this is pretty normal. But it turns out this is a process by which we can take what were otherwise analog tasks and move them to digital formats, but in doing so, instantiate them in some sort of system of order. That's not that bad. But what this does mean is that lots of things that used to be deeply human now can be mechanized. This is also a de-anthropization of this process in which we can begin doing things at scales that aren't human scales anymore. And this isn't just a process of forcing people to behave like machines in their workplaces. We also see this in terms of augmentations of their minds, their souls, and their relationships. The moral of this story is don't date AI boyfriends and girlfriends. We also see the process of becoming, uh, of taking machine and turning it to something more manlike. Um, we look at this, my background was computational neuroscience, and if you told me that we'd have the latent capabilities of frontier models that we have today, if you told me that in 2013, I would have asked you to pass a hit of that because that shit sounds fire. Um, there's no way that we were going to get here by now. Um, but it turns out that despite the efforts of whole brain emulation, simulation will get you really far up the capabilities ladder. And what we found is that by flattening the neural problem space and saying, I do not need to simulate dendrites, I don't even need to really simulate neurons in any log uh, biological fidelity, you can still get profound capabilities that end up being very, very human-like. Um, so who can complete the rest of this? Because it turns out it's true. Roses are red, violets are blue, I am a stochastic parrot, and... How did you do that? <laughs> wow. So when I think about this relationship between man and machine and where this is going, we try to break it into these few phases. Uh, man apart from machine, which is where we've been. Man on machine, or machine on man, which is where we are now. Uh, machine in man, which is where we're at the bleeding edge of. And machine apart from man, but having passed through the other side. You are just about here. And I think this is important to point out, and I borrow the William Gibson apocryphal quote that the future's already arrived, but it's just not evenly distributed yet, because I don't think that it actually unfolds this linearly. I think when we look at this part of the tech tree, we do find that for things like what would be, we'd consider something like brain machine interface and brain computer interface, we're somewhere in this timeline, but it actually could be that because as we've made machines more human-like and as we made humans more machine-like, things like being able to predictively model like you just did, the next tokens in the sequence, but about entire parts of our behavioral repertoire means that we might get machines that are capable of representing us as digital twins in non-anthropically scaled spaces much faster than we thought, which you'd think would kind of come after us and better integration. But in terms of you being represented as a data construct sent out into the net, that might happen much prior to you having a piece of something jammed in your skull.
So in this sense, the tech tree may have jagged timelines. It will not be a, sw a swift linear progression between these. And I think that it's going to come wrapped in weird ways. I don't think that cyborgization as a phenomenon is going to arrive either monolithically all at once or in a way that we're going to find viscerally uncomfortable. I think in some ways we already have soft cyborgization. And with increasing corporate buy-in, sponsorship, and smooth millennial packaging. And it's going to come in these concepts of things like assistance, productivity, companionship. Look, we're not saying that you have to do this, but if you want to continue to participate in the workplace for economic inclusion, most of our employees are already doing this, and we don't want you to feel left behind, mental health or the entertainment sector. So in some ways, this is where we are right now, and I want us to be cognizant that this is a process that we do get to actively invent, which begs the question, what do we want out of this? Because humanity does get a little bit of a say about which direction this is all going to go. When we keep in mind the incentive structures of all of these, I think humans have a semblance of an understanding of the types of things that could be good for us to want. And if we don't, because I work in AI governance and AI safety, I go back to Aristotle. Um, and I will completely get shot at on the hill of quoting Aristotle at a talk at Vision Weekend. But I think it's important because I think he gives us a notion of what could count as a virtuous life in Nicomachean ethics. And a virtuous world here is one in which our technologies and the fusion of us and our technologies keeps in mind that the things that have made us strong and good so far have been focusing on temperance, justice, fortitude, and prudence as cardinal virtues that make our societies rich. And with that, I'd like to say thank you. This has been a brief snapshot on what the future is shaped like and what we could do to keep in mind ways where we continue to flourish and get to imagine what that future of, towards existential hope gets to look like when it comes to cyborgs. Thank you. I told you it was going to be weird. I told you it was going to be weird.